If you haven't read today's prasha, there's a lot in there. So you, people can come up with a lot of different teachings from this one. So. Today is Shabbat Kodesh. The crescent moon will be seen Sunday evening. So this month we will con- coincide with the uh, Jewish calendar which is not unusual. It is also the 30th day of the month, so whether they see it in Israel or not, the month is declared. So, it's just one of those things. <laughs> it happens every once in a while. I put up on the screen the uh, readings for the Kodesh, and the Kodesh is usually a family celebration. It's a monthly realignment, a refocus, It is actually the second most commanded observance in Scripture. The first one is the Shabbat. The second one is the Kodesh. And then you have the Feast of Yehovah. So. I see a few of you writing, so I'm stalling. <laughs> It has been up on uh, the website before, and I try to put it in every single uh, PowerPoint on the Sabbath before the new moon, so you can check on those. Okay. At the very least, the PowerPoint will be up. <laughs> right. <laughs> I had a thought for the day. Some of us can empathize with this. Opportunity may knock only once, but sin, sin keeps leaning on the doorbell. <laughs> so, what are you going to do? You recognize it for what it is and go engross yourself in something else. <laughs> or as we used to do, I kept a Bible by the door when the doorbell rang and some of our visitors would want to t- tell us about the Word. You, you deal with the temptation with the Word. It's amazing how fast Satan catches on. In the physical realm, I used to have people come by with their groups to proselyze and they'd stand in front of my house at the front of the sidewalk and ask her, you go that way, you go that way, you go that way. Nobody walk up that sidewalk to that house. <laughs> Why? Because every time they came into my house, they got the true scriptures. It messed with their theology. <laughs> Why? Because the Father always has an answer for those who say they serve Him, but are serving Him in man's religion. And when you present the scriptures, I mean, I even had a child teaching her mother the scriptures, you know, sitting there in front of me as we were contravening the teachings of the Jehovah's Witnesses. But that's another issue. (laughs) Musicians, there's a lot of things I had to really bounce around what I was going to cover today. Uh, I try not to bring things that are too heavy. Something that might be heavy to you might not be heavy to me, and vice versa. Because I always look at the source of my joy. I want to look at, you know, at the end of all these troubling things that are going to happen, what's going to be the outcome? And as Yeshua said, he who continues to the end will be saved. saved resurrected in his eternal kingdom walking with him you know if you don't know what else to think when you're going through tough times that's a good one right there so the magicians of Egypt did in like manner it says with their enchantments Pharaoh's heart was hardened he hearkened not to them as Yehovah had spoken By the way, he spoke that back at the bush. Why?
why, I'm not going into this today, but why was judgment already set for Egypt? Why had he already seen that the heart of the leadership of Egypt was hardened? What had they done that caused him to declare their judgment? You can go read about Manasseh in Israel, in Kings and Chronicles, and you see that because of the wickedness that he did, judgment was declared, even though they had two or three righteous kings afterwards, judgment was declared. And it did happen. So, let's take a look at the magicians, getting back here. What, why did the magicians of Egypt duplicate the actions of Moses and of Aaron? What did it prove to them? How did Yehovah prove his power in and through their actions? Some of the questions we take a look at. So, in 2 Timothy 3.8 we read, Even Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these withstand the truth. Men corrupted in mind, reprobate concerning the faith. Read that entire chapter in 2 Timothy. From verse 1 to verse 8 is a revealing of how insidious error comes into the congregation. We see the insidiousness of false religions, false teachings. And so Pharaoh thought that he had a corner on the market of knowledge. He thought his magicians c could not do anything wrong. Okay? So the things happening are repeated in these end of days. That is said by Yeshua in Matthew 24 in parallel passages. And Yeshua does give each and every one of us a warning. And when these end of days come, be aware. Be alert. You know? In uh, 722, and the magicians of Egypt did in like manner with their enchantments, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he hearkened not to them as Yehovah had spoken. Now, I did cover hardening of the heart last week, so I won't go into that. So the occult of the Egyptians was thought to be the greatest in the world. They thought that Moses was an occult master of some desert god. How did that work out for them? Evidently, they did not consider there is a Elohim, an Almighty One in heaven that is over all. He is above all. He is the Elohim of Elohims. So don't be surprised in this as Korah and others in number 16 seem to repeat the same thing Pharaoh did. They reflected the same attitude in the wilderness when they confused their own holiness, their own revelations of to be superior to that of Moses. They even challenged Moses and said, all the people are holy, so are we. So they set up their own tabernacle outside the camp, not the one with which Moses was commanded to set up. Check that out in Numbers. What did they do? They tried to set their threshold, their tabernacle, next to that of the fathers. That's something we are specifically commanded not to do. When Yehovah says, you will worship me in this place, he declared the place. When he told us, we, you will worship me in this way, he directed Moses to correctly write down the way. He even commanded Moses to write down in Numbers that we should not follow our own hearts, but follow strictly the commands of Yehovah. And we see that that's not what Korah did in Numbers. That's not what Pharaoh did. In fact, Pharaoh 
was a pagan. He had no knowledge of the God of Joseph, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Again, we read in Revelation 9, 20, and 21, things do repeat themselves in history. And this is a future statement. And this is talking about after the judgments, after the plagues. He said, And the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues repented not of the works of their hands, that they should worship, not worship demons, the idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they repented not of their murders or sorceries, nor their fornications, nor their thefts. You can go into a long discourse on the subtleties of today's religions, today's New Age, today's, you know, all-inclusiveness. Oh, everyone needs to be tolerant. Everyone needs to be inclusive. You know, toleration is the last foothold of confusion. Think about that. People are tolerant because they don't have a foundation. We have the scriptures. They don't have a belief system. So when you and I follow the words of the Father, we have a foundation. We have a system of approaching him, as he said. But we do not see that in Korah. We do not see that in these people at the end of the age. What we do see is what has happened in the past will be repeated again and again. In 22 again, Exodus, the magicians did in like manner. Pharaoh turned and went into his house and neither did he lay it to heart. We have seen a couple years ago we had a 154 tornadoes go through the Midwest in a period of a month and a half. Was that the judgment of the Father? What does judgment look like? We've had the fires in California take out millions of acres. Not just California. Idaho, you don't hear about Idaho, do you? Parts of Montana. You know, what does judgment look like? Okay, and the people do not lay it to heart. So, what did the miracle prove to Pharaoh and his people? What did it prove to them? Not a thing. Moses did in eight nine was to heighten Pharaoh's senses. In Exodus eight nine, we read, Moses said to Pharaoh, "This is after the plague." said, so you can have the honor naming the time when I will pray for you. Who's praying? Moses. To whom? Jehovah. The Father? Jehovah. For? Pharaoh. On behalf of for and on behalf of Pharaoh. Yes. To be rid of the frogs, both yourselves and your homes, and they will stay in the river only. So, the power of the Father is defining. He actually defines when this will end. See, here's the thing about Pharaoh's magicians. They could start something, but they couldn't define when it would end. Father in heaven can define when something begins. He can define when it stops. He can define who it's going to affect. So what did Moses do in chapter 8 and 9 that should heighten Pharaoh's senses? Pharaoh, if he was really listening because he didn't think he was the God, if he was really listening, he would have got the message from Moses that the Elohim of Moses could define the end of his troubles, his plagues. Okay? There's a spiritual message in there that Pharaoh was missing it. He 
he does not attune to the ways of the Father. <clears throat> we read in Revelation 9, 20 and 21, but the rest of the people who were not put to death by these evil plagues, by these wars, by these diseases, had not turned from the works of their hands, and they had no re regret for putting men to death for the use of secret arts, for evil desires of the flesh, or taking the property of others. Now you see a list right there of why the nations at this period of time in Revelation are deserving of judgment. And who is he speaking this to? He's actually speaking this to you and me, his servants. While we are reading things like this, and he's defining why judgment is just upon these nations, he's also showing us the correct way to walk. When we see these things, we should be turning and walking the other way. We should be walking in righteousness and holiness and showing to the world our set-apart walk. People will look at you and ask you what you're doing and why. Right, Kathleen? Outside reading a book, right? How many people go outside and read a book and walk the four corners? Believers, yes. I haven't heard of any others that do something crazy like that. Why is it crazy? Because we actually believe and know that he will do what he said he would do. By the way, I do not believe you just walk around and anoint your corners. You do need to make a vocal declaration. You do need to speak into the universe the words of the Father because you're not doing it for yourself. You're reminding Him of what He said. You're calling on Him to be true to the covenant. He called it his covenant, my covenant. You're just reminding him of that, and you're declaring, by your declaring, that you are under his covenant. So when we pray, we need to remember whose covenant we are under. Why did Yehovah prove it? How did he prove his power in and through the ending of the three signs? Okay, I just went through this. People had no regret. Pharaoh had no regret. Pharaoh had put people to death. Mine says, oh, I guess it's the saying, it says they did not repent. They did not repent. Yeah. Okay. Of their murders and their sorceries. Right. So. Repent, turn around. Right. <clears throat> So, if, if you're looking for one of the reasons judgment was due on Pharaoh, upon Egypt, is because of the shedding of innocent blood. This is a subtle line through the book of Exodus, especially through the first part of it. Why did judgment have to come? I mentioned Manasseh. Go read the story of Manasseh in the book of Kings and one of the judgments against him was because he shed innocent blood throughout the city of Jerusalem and the land. The blood does cry out. You learn that in Genesis chapter 4, right? Cain and Abel? Or it might be 5, I'm sorry. You know, innocent blood does climb up, a uh, cry out, and judgment will be rendered. Having Second uh, Peter three three and four talks about people that have all the knowledge that in the last days there will be men who rule ruled by evil desires will make sport of holy things, saying mockingly. The brackets is mine, by the way. Where is the hope of his coming? From the death of the fathers till now, everything has gone on as it was from the making of the world. 
And some people don't believe in the making of the world because they believe in evolution. So even that is a mocking by some people. See, people have their own excuses for not following the Father. <clears throat> so let's review. Aaron's staff on becoming a serpent did what? It ate up all the serpents of Pharaoh's magicians. Not one, not one and a half, all, every single one. Next, the plague, the plague of frogs. Ended on the day and time that Moses said it would. Just because he gave Pharaoh the you know, option to designate when he would pray doesn't change the fact that the Father designated the end of that judgment. So why was Pharaoh's heart and mind hardened? Why did the people of today harden their minds and hearts? There are three things. I'm going to put together three things. Yeshua gives us some encouragement in the book of Matthew chapter 13. By the way, that's a very good chapter to read and study in a little detail. Blessed are your eyes, for they see, your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desire to see the things you see and did not see them. And to hear the things you hear and did not hear them. And then he goes on and explains to them the parable of the sower. And he tells you that the sower is. Yeshua is the sower. And go through the rest of that. So the three things. The things of this world explain away the ways and favor of Yehovah working in our lives. This is often a derision and a flippant pride in their not ascribing honor to the Father. Pharaoh did not ascribe honor to the Father. He explained away things. Oh, it's just a natural occurrence of things. You know, if you've ever prayed and you have seen weather change, if, you, if you've ever seen hurricanes diminish in size from a Cat 5 to a Cat 3, which was almost unheard of, I mean, stop and think about that. You and I, we are sensitive in the spirit. We see those things, and the world goes out there and mocks it. Oh, it's just a way of nature. Actually, it wasn't. <laughs> and the fact that it happened twice in one year two cat fives degrading down to cat threes, that should give you a hint. You know, your father is in the business of working for you. Okay. Number two, the people through the distractions of the world harden their hearts. That's part of that sower of the seed, by the way. Go look at that. They harden their hearts to the message Yehovah is trying to bring to them. They don't see his concern nor his provisions. Anytime there's a judgment, there's always an opportunity to repent. Anytime you repent, there's always an opportunity for favor to flow to you. Of course, if you're already walking in repentance, you know, I tell people, I say, I walk in favor. It walks around me. I keep on declaring that. Why? Because I've seen it too many times. It can be the car cutting across four lanes of traffic and getting off on an exit. <laughs> you missed it. Actually, he missed you. Which way does it go? But the Father protected you. Look at the mercy of the Father. He protected that person from getting in an accident. <laughs> you see? See, the Father's compassion isn't just for you and me. It's for those that don't believe. So let's go through these a little bit. The things of the world explain away the, the ways and the favor of Yehovah. In Romans 1, 18-23, the wrath of Elohim is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and righteousness of men who hinder the truth in their unrighteousness. Because that 
which is known of the Father is manifest to them, for God made it known to them. For the invisible things of him since the creation of the world are clearly seen, being perceived through the things which are made, even his everlasting power and his divinity. So they are without excuse. And continuing in that, because that knowing Elohim, they glorified him not as Elohim, neither did they give thanks, but they became vain in their reasonings. They professed themselves wise, they become fools, and change the glory of the incorruptible Elohim for the likeness of image of corruptible man, of birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things. You can see this repeated throughout the book of Revelation in the judgments. When the judgments start to fall in Revelation chapter 8. Take a look at that. What are the judgments when they start falling? They to a great extent will be following the plagues here in Egypt. That's another study. I'm not going to break that one down today. Number two, the people through their distractions of the world harden their hearts. And we read in Matthew 13, 18 through 22, speaking about the seed that was sown. So listen to what the parable says. Whoever hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, it's like the seed sown along the path. The evil one comes and seizes it, seizes what is sown in his heart, and the seed sown on rocky ground is like a person who hears the message and accepts it with joy at once. And what happens? But has no root. So, why are we here? We're trying to learn to grow to establish our root. Because these did not have root. The person on the path is a person who is didn't even hear enough to make a decision of salvation. Oh, that sounds nice. It's a lovely message. And they walk away. And that's the end of their religious experience with the Father. You got some sown on the stony ground. It says the cares of the world choke them out. So that may be a person who just barely gets into the kingdom. You know, that's a compassion of the Father too. You might just make it into the kingdom. He's glad you're there. But you could have had a lot more. So continue reading that passage when you can. The next battle mine, I'm going to abbreviate that a little bit, move on to number three, is that of Pharaoh's mind. And anybody who's ever read the book by uh, Joyce Meyer, The Battlefield of the Mind? No. Well, it's rather famous out there. Well, there's pr there's probably two or three people out there that wrote one. She's the, she's the one I think of offhand. <laughs> but what does it say? Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction and haughty spirit before a fall. So arrogance and pride are the root and the cause of many to fall. This is a famous verse in Messianic congregations. We all read a little di bit differently than you do because when we preach this verse in this chapter, we preach a different message. The way we preach it is, In the year that the king of pride died, I saw Adonai sitting upon his throne high and lifted up. Now, for you to understand that little paraphrase, you have to understand, what did Uzziah do? Why would I call him the king of pride? He went into the temple, into the holy place to offer incense. I've built all these great war structures. I'm the most powerful king in the area. I control the traffic lanes from Egypt to Babylon. I'm going to go into the temple and offer incense. How'd that work out for 
<laughs> Good question. How did it work out for him? Yeah. As he was approaching with the censer to offer incense, it says the Zara broke out upon him, and I think it says 70 priests escorted him out of there. There's a prophetic number in that 70 I won't go into, but they escorted him out of there. It says he had to live in the house by his own self. His son ruled in his stead, and he stayed there till the day he died. The sad part about that story is he did not have the heart of David. What did David do when he messed up? <laughs> he went and fell on his face and repented from his heart. See, that's why pride is so insidious and so dangerous. Pride in Uzziah presented, prevented him from returning to the father who had loved him all those years and brought him such glory in the land. He let it go to his head. He let his mind be changed to the evil side, as some people say. So, the battleground, that of Pharaoh's mind. In 2 Chronicles 26, 15 and 16, he made in Jerusalem, Jerusalem engines. I forgot I put this verse in here. You know, invented by skillful men, towers, battlements, to shoot arrows and great stones. His name was spread far and wide. Oh, wow. And he was marvelously helped until he was strong. When you or I become strong, that's the time to beware. Because sometimes our thinking will open the door for how Satan to come in, and we don't listen to the correction. His heart was lifted up, so he did corruptly, and he trespassed against Yahweh. He went into the temple to burn incense. Okay, so that's where King Uzziah failed the battle in his mind. He won the earthly battles. He had the power in the earthly realm, but in the battle of his mind, he fell. What level would Uzziah have been raised to? Would he be considered another David if he hadn't have failed that test? Oh, I'm so sorry. You know? Hallelujah. In Matthew 4, 3, it says, The tempter came and said to him, to Yeshua, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. I can guarantee to you that after 40 days, you will be a little bit hungry. So we see two contrasts here. The deceiver came to Uzziah when he was strong. The deceiver came to Yeshua when he was weak. In both cases, you still have to be aware and focus on the Father. Yeshua was tested. Abraham was tested. Lot was tested. Pharaoh was tested. All are tested on their, what? Appointed days. Each of us has an appointed day where we will be tested. And I pray for each of you that you will overcome valiantly. A little conclusion here. In Micah 6, 8, He has showed you, O man, what is good and what Yehovah does require of you. It's a little song out there about that. But to do justly and to love, kind, love kindness and to walk humbly before your, your God. In Matthew 10, 22, you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. That's real encouraging. But he that endures till the end shall be saved. This is part of the encouragement I want you to make sure I embrace, you embrace. It's not what goes on around us. You, know, you do not always suffer because you did something wrong. Face it. People, when they see you walk a set apart walk, they are going to react against you. 
They hate you. They're hostile to you. They don't want anything to do with you. They'll cut you off. Uh, they'll call you a bigot. They didn't look in the mirror that day. <laughs> Matthew 24, 13. He that endures till the end shall be saved. Matthew, Mark 13, 13. And you shall be hated for all men, of all men for my name's sake. But he that endures till the end shall be saved. So, we have a teaching. Our battlefield is the mind. Our battlefield is the world. But we are told and encouraged. We must continue to the end. And if you want to know if it's worth it, go read chapter 20, 21, and 22 in Revelation. Go read the prophets that talk about the days of the greater ingathering. It will be worth it. For some of us, we'll be there. For some of us, you'll be given rulership. For some, you might even be in the inner court. Don't forget me when you get there. <laughs> you know? Think about that. When I talk about the inner court, I'm talking about people who have a right to be closer to Yeshua, closer to the Father, because they decided to embrace the ways of the house. That's what the scripture is all about, preparing us to be in the house. We don't want to be the servant that's outside. We don't want to be the five foolish virgins who didn't get into the marriage feast. Why didn't they get into the marriage feast? They didn't follow directions. They didn't have the oil of the Torah. I know the church teaches that's the Holy Spirit. I have a different teaching, but that's from Proverbs chapter 6. The reason they couldn't get in is because what did Yeshua say at the door? I did not know you. He knows those who follow his ways. He knows those who embrace the holy walk. He defined that holy walk in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Okay? So that's what we need to focus on. Following his ways and not worrying what the world says about us. So, so, that's the end of my message for the day. <laughs> Hope it's encouraging. <laughs>